time to tackle a rather delicate and difficult <laughs> subject, uh, that being men and sex. And this is an important topic to examine in large part because people are so uncomfortable about it. I usually mask uh, any discussions of sex in, in humour, in dick jokes and so on. I will endeavour and struggle not to do so today because this is a very important subject and I think it's a big part of where the cultural zeitgeist is hurting men. That may seem surprising to you, we're constantly hearing about sexual assault, sexual harassment and rape stats and rape culture and all, all this kind of thing. But I think in our in our frenzy to rightly protect and um, make things better for women, I think in some cases we're overextending and we're taking it to the point where we begin to harm men. And I think uh, Me Too and the issues in American universities are probably the prime examples of this. It seems very weird and strange to me that we live in such a puritanical age. Obviously my parents grew up in the 60s and 70s, the kind of hippie free love era. Uh, in spite of AIDS, the, the 80s was fairly loose and open about sexuality. Uh, whether gay or straight or whatever, and really brought uh, gay sexuality to the fore for a lot of people. The, the, the 90s were fairly libertine, even at the height of riot girls and the previous wave of political correctness. But then you get to about 2010 and something changes. Sexuality starts to be seen as bad again, and men's sexuality in particular seems to be seen as inherently dangerous or bad or wrong. We had a wave of liberalisation and libertinism that came with the internet, which opened up pornography and sexual communication via a safe medium to a whole raft of people. And then something seems to have happened, and weirdly it seems to have happened in the kinds of left-wing circles that previously used to be you know, very for free love and liberalising laws around free speech and uh, pornography and prostitution or sex work, whichever way you want to call it, all, all of that. And now that very same political wing that used to be more libertine seems to be pushing censorship and uh, a hostile personal atmosphere towards sexuality in general, but male sexuality in particular. There's two pieces of advice that I wish I had been given uh, as a teenager, as, as a young man. Uh, so I'm going to relay them here, and they're going to seem absurd to a lot of people, but I, I think even in this day and age, it, it was, it was kind of weird back when I was a kid, but uh, I, I think even today this is still something that is useful to tell young men. Women like and want sex, they're just careful about it. And you're allowed to like what you like, so long as everyone's consenting, it's a good time for everyone. Now, it may seem stupid <laughs> to you, but I grew up intensely ashamed of my own sexuality, and I can only compare it to the way in which gay friends of mine have described the difficulties they felt wrestling with their sexuality and their feelings. But for me, the problem for me was that I appeared to be wired for kink even from quite a young age and a male dominant kink. Too much information possibly, but, but there you go, I'm, I'm not exactly shy about anything about myself. But, I thought something was wrong with me. I was ashamed of what I wanted. I didn't think any woman could possibly ever want anything like that. I ended up uh, lying to friends and family in order to sneak away and just to observe the kink community once I even found out that they existed and trying to 
to puzzle out uh, what I felt, what I wanted, whether I needed it, or whether it was just a want, all of these kind of things. And even in the more liberal, more open, less repressed, less repressive atmosphere, you know, when I was young, I was worried that my desires, my wants, made me a potential rapist or uh, a monster of some kind. And it didn't, and that's nonsense. And, you know, you can live without indulging your kinks, but there's nothing really to be ashamed of there, and we should all be more open about it. The important thing, and I think this is what a lot of people miss about the kink community in, in, in particular, the important thing is consent. And that's baked in to the, the BDSM scene and everything else. People are very open about what they want, why they want it, how they want it. This is a massively healthy thing. And yet that community gets targeted in particular for a lot of opprobrium. Even if you're not kinky, I think using the lens of the kink community to examine sexuality as a whole can be quite useful. Uh, I think it exaggerates things to the point where they're easier to see, easier to look at. And I think we can use that group, the, the kinky group, to diagnose some of the things about sexuality as a whole in our societies. Take, for example, some of the complaints within the kink community. Since the advent of Fifty Shades of Grey, there seems to have been a flood of early middle-aged women into the kink community looking for something that they are simply not getting in their day-to-day -day lives. And they're not really necessarily particularly kinky, they just want a man who is going to take charge in some way in the bedroom and they are unable to find that. Otherwise, they're actually pretty vanilla, and Fifty Shades of Grey is a terrible thing <laughs> in regards to any any ideas, any concept, any conceit of what the kink community is like. The main character is awful. You know, they don't seek consent. They're a stalker. They do terrible, awful things. But it's all acceptable because he's a billionaire and a playboy, and he's quite handsome. So there's that side of things. But then also on the other side of things. The kink community also seems to have been flooded by a lot of vanilla men who just want to be allowed to take charge in the bedroom. They want a context and a community in which that's expected of them. You know, They may not be into anything else particularly, but they quite like being able to take charge. And by finding someone who explicitly consents to be submissive to them, they're getting something, another an itch of their own that isn't scratched. Now, ideally, you'd think you could bring those two communities together, but that doesn't seem to be what actually happens in real life. But it seems clear that there's a lot of men who want to take charge, and there's a lot of women that want to submit, and by no means, not all, and not completely, and not to the extent that it happens in kink, but they're unable to get those itches scratched, and so they go looking for it, where they might not necessarily be welcome. There's an issue running concurrent to this, which goes back to how I was saying I felt ashamed of, of what I wanted, what, what I needed, what I sought from sex. The, the queer community has always been a part of the kink community to one degree or another, but it, to a greater and greater extent it seems to have kind of co-opted the whole thing. There's a lot of shaming of male dominance that goes on. There's articles written, which is how I know about it for the most part, that go on about this. How it, how terrible it is that there's all these cisgender straight men in the, in the kink community. It seems odd. I mean, this community, like so many other communities, has been open and welcoming to people, and that appears to have been its downfall to some extent, because it has, it has welcomed people into it that don't like it and want to change it, and are bringing the shaming and so on from outside into it that many people were trying to avoid, and the, an openness in that community that they valued a great deal. So that's something to consider. I think we can see that kind of entryism going on 
elsewhere. And it's the entryism and the shaming and the, the hatred that goes on that people are upset by, not the fact that someone's queer or gay or trans or, or whatever else it is. So that's worth considering. And again, we see that again in the, in the greater culture. Men's sexuality is seen as dangerous, as predatory. Every man is seen as a potential rapist. Men are considered guilty rather than innocent, and they have to prove their innocence. The guilt doesn't have to be proven. Pornography, main consumers are men. That's demonized for no good reason. If there is evidence of the effect that porno pornography has on the community as a whole, it seems to be a positive, because where access to porn is easier, there's less rape, less sexual assault, and so on. And the people making arguments against pornography often uh, tend to make the arguments that it somehow leads to those things, or it leads to human trafficking. When I was younger, I worked in drug education for a couple of years, and um, we were taking a more laissez-faire modern approach to educating people about drugs. Rather than trying to scaremonger people, because to do that you kind of had to lie, really, we would talk about, okay, this is the drug, this is what it does, these are the dangers, these are how it makes you feel, and we would be honest about it and treat the people we were talking to like adults about it. And that was very effective, but it was impolitic. It wasn't politically correct for the Conservative government at the time. Local funding got withdrawn and I didn't get that work anymore. Similarly with sex, I think it's important to inform people and educate people if we want to control these problems and issues and not to shame and hate people and not to lie about it. Because if we lie about it, we lose people's trust. So if we lie and we say that pornography feeds human trafficking or that consenting sex work feeds human trafficking, people know it's bullshit. Someone watches a porno, gets off, gets their itch scratched and notices that they don't actually want to rape anybody or to treat anybody like shit unless they consent to it any more than they did before. So your argument that it is warping their fragile little minds just doesn't hold up. And when it comes to porn actresses and so on, I mean, they're all on social media these days. So if you see someone in a porno that you particularly like, you can go and you can look them up and you can see that they're a real person and you can interact with them. And a lot of them seem to thrive on the fact that they're showing themselves to be a real person and engaging in conversation and so on with their fans or just showing their lives, their day-to-day -day lives. That increases the connection. That seems to be what a lot of men want. An emotional connection, not just a purely physical connection. And we put all that at risk when we attack these things and we lie about them. There's a feminist that I used to boost quite a bit, uh, Cindy Gallup. She's uh, reasonably famous. She's nowhere near as bad as Gail Dines. Uh, she's behind the Make Love Not Porn um, website and, and campaign. And there's a lot laudable ab about that. But in spite of her negative opinions on porn and so on, I think she finds some of the same problems we had when we were educating about drugs. You know, we were, we're supposed to inform people but the government wanted us to warn people away from them and in some cases you can't really make any kind of strong case as to why someone shouldn't take them is there any particular reason why you shouldn't eat marijuana edibles not not really unless you've got underlying schizophrenia or something and the only bad thing we could say about psilocybin mushrooms was you might pick the wrong ones and similarly, the, the sites and stuff that she runs, yeah, they're, they're trying to educate people away from things they regard as, as degrading and, and, uh, and horrible in, in porn, which they're not if you consent, they're fun. But the most they can ever say about it is some people might like this. So they, they say the thing that they consider to be bad and there's always that provisor, you know, um, not every woman wants you to spuff on their face, but some do. It's just, it's just absurd. And this, is the, whatever you like, is okay to like. 
your partner may not want it. In which case, you know, give and give and take, maybe on your birthday or something, you know. And the other way around, there's things that women want that you might feel uncomfortable about. And it's okay to indulge them once in a while. And it's also okay to say no. It's a negotiation. And this is why I think it's so absurd to hate on the kink community. Because if there is a model for consent, that's the one to be upfront about all the things you like and to negotiate and give and take with each other. Given Me Too and the hostility to male sexuality in general that we're seeing everywhere, uh, the clamp down on pornography in the United Kingdom and, and so on, you would think that we were in the midst of some epidemic of violent sexual misconduct, that men were roaming the streets in gangs looking for a malenky bit of ultraviolence and a bit of the old in out. It's not the case at all. Sexual assault statistics have been in freefall since since the 90s, really. It's rarely been better, if ever, than it is now. So it doesn't reflect reality to go at men in this way, to go at pornography in this way, to go at sex work in this way. All of these things are likely to make the situation worse because it's this liberalisation that has made them better. An interesting comparison to draw would be with abortion. Now, if you're against abortion, paradoxically, the best thing you can probably do, and which very few, if any, anti-abortion groups do, but if you want to reduce abortion, the absolute best way to do it is to have abortion be freely and easily available and to have lots and lots of decent sex education starting early and yet many of the anti-abortion groups are also anti-sex education and so on it seems counterintuitive but this is what the statistics show and if so if you're against sexual assault if you're against rape if you're against sexual exploitation and sex trafficking and so on it makes more sense to be pro-porn to be libertine to be for the decriminalization or even the legalization of sex work and so on but people don't and it's for similar reasons their ideological bases on which they attack these things are essentially a faith similar to the way in which most anti-abortion groups and anti-sex education groups that derives from their religious faith rather than their secular faith and yet so they end up working against their own aims this isn't just limited to personal interactions where, where there is a problem because this prevailing ideological wind does affect the way in which the law is administered and the law is interfering in people's private sexuality. We have universities, for example, that if a guy is accused of sexual assault or rape or whatever, he isn't treated as innocent until proven guilty. He's considered guilty until proven innocent at least socially and rather than a beyond reasonable doubt standard it is reduced to a preponderance of evidence standard so people are getting their lives and careers ruined over what may well be an unsafe prosecution and over here in the UK the Crown Prosecution Service has issued guidelines that tighten these things up that toughen them up that undermine someone's right to be presumed innocent and nobody wants a rapist or a molester or anyone else to get away with it and to and to get away but are we really willing to toss out the very basis of our justice system in order to do so there was even an attempt in new zealand to make sexual allegations subject to inquisitorial justice that is on the books to be considered guilty until proven innocent rather than merely socially. Fortunately that failed as far as I'm aware. So yeah, it filters into law. Increased censorship, criminalization of clients, of sex workers, and this attitude that male sexuality must be bad and yet despite all this men still seem to be driven to seek out these things. When I was talking about mental health I was talking about how men need to feel useful 
And just to, to wrap this up and to link those two things together, a result of that, I think, has been the emergence of financial doms, fin doms, usually women. Now, whatever your kink might be, I'm not going to shame you for it. But this it just kind of encapsulates the whole thing for me. In a world full of strong, independent women who don't need no man, men often feel superfluous. Like they're not needed, they're not wanted. And some men have such a deep-seated need to provide that they will just send money to women. And that somehow takes on a, a sexual connotation and context for them. These are called financial doms. Two M's and an E. And all they do is send them money. They don't really get anything from it other than maybe derided and so on. It's like having a demanding high-maintenance wife with none of the benefits. And yet people do it. And I'm not shaming you. If that's your kink, fine. But I think that kind of says it all about men's drive to be useful, to provide, to be wanted, to be needed in some way. That paying someone for nothing has become a kink. Zang. The gallows is cold and the gibbet is lonely. We'll make things hard for you here. The gallows is cold and the gibbet is lonely. We'll make things hard for you, Joey, my dear. Today. See, I, I, I don't like the, I, I have, okay, like a lot of you, I hate a lot, you know, <laughs> but I hate with style and creativity. <laughs>